Stephen P. Kitty Cat, your reign of terror ends today. You see this? Say hello to your replacement. Oh, yes. Now, you've refused to host the show, even though it says in your contract you're supposed to host the show. Then when I try to host the show, you got your attorney involved to lock me out. But I can read contracts, too. Don't yawn at me. I can read contracts, too. I'm allowed to add props whenever I want. This is a new animatronic, and this thing is going to be lifelike and adorable. It's going to be the biggest thing since Baby Yoda. I found a new special effects team. These guys have worked with Stan Winston and Glenn Hetrick and Henson's Creature Shop and others, and they are good. And I tell you, as soon as those guys with the mouse ears get a load of this, they're going to want to buy the show, and I will use their attorneys to beat your attorney into the dust. Let's check this out. Yeah, you should look scared. This is the end of you, Steve. This is going to make you look foolish. Damn you, Wish.com. Hello, and welcome to Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. I am your host, Steve the Cat. You know, I'm not even going to complain about the social media fact checkers this week. They kind of have a point this time around. Not only is this not Steve the Cat, this is not even Steve's animatronic stunt double. This is a new animatronic double that we have ordered from a world-renowned creature shop. Um... Yeah, he's a little bit disappointing. Uh, I had requested something adorably lifelike, hoping to cash in on some of those sweet, sweet Baby Yoda merchandising bucks. Um, it turns out that the term uh, adorably lifelike is not quantifiable in any kind of legally actionable sense. So this is what we get. Anyway, we call him Fancy. This is Fancy, the new uh, animatronic stunt double. My name is Carl. I'm the production assistant. I'm behind the camera. Hello. Uh, so welcome to Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. This is the show where we review horror movies. Now, if you're new to the show, we review horror movies here and we try to make the show accessible to people who are maybe new fans of horror or casual fans of horror who want to learn a little more. Uh, basically, we try to help you navigate the jungle that is the thousands of horror movies available on streaming services. Uh, we've got a good show today, so we're going to get right to it. We're doing Creature Cinema today, and not only that, we are doing a Creature Feature Double Feature, so let's get to it. Once again, it is time for Steve's vocabulary lesson. This is the part of the show where we investigate dynamic usage of the English language in an effort to stay ahead of social media bots and algorithms that would try to ban us. So short lesson this week, we've only got two words. Both of them are adjectives. Word number one, albatrossian. This is an adjective used to describe a person who is characterized by an inescapable tendency to bring misfortune or disaster upon others. In filmmaking, an albatrossian character is an unending source of difficulty for other characters. These difficulties may or may not be the result of intentional actions, so you don't have to go out of your way to do things intentionally to be albatrossian. Word number two, Jar Jar Binksian. This is another adjective used to describe a person characterized by an unending and unstoppable power to annoy, agitate, and otherwise disturb others in a manner so severe that other adjectives simply are not sufficient. In filmmaking, a Jar Jar Binksian character instills the audience with an insatiable desire to see that character die horribly in every scene of the film. 
Uh, I think the entomology of this word is pretty obvious, but uh, we won't get into it because I'm trying to avoid the ire of those people with the mouse ears. Anyway, that's Steve's vocabulary lesson for this week. So as we said, this week we are doing a creature feature double feature. And our featured creature for this week is... Sharks. I love sharks. Let's talk about sharks. Sharks are apex predators. They make the perfect subject for a horror movie because they are terrifying. You don't know if they're there. They could be underneath you and you can't see them. You can't hear them. You can't smell them. And by the time they hit you, it's too late. Plus, everyone just has an, an intrinsic fear of being eaten. They are fish. Now, it feels silly to have to point that out, but there are people who get confused and don't realize that whales and dolphins are not fish. They are, in fact, mammals. So just to make sure people understand, whales and dolphins are mammals, but sharks are, in fact, fish. They're cold-blooded. They have gills. They breathe water. They're fish. They're different from a lot of fish, though, in that they are what is known as cartilaginous, which means they don't have bones. They just have lots of cartilage, like that stuff that makes up your earlobes and... Uh, at least if you're younger, cushions your kneecaps. Uh, those of us who are older don't have a whole lot of cushion left in our kneecaps, but that's a subject for another day. They have lots of nasty, big, pointy teeth. And in fact, their teeth are like on little conveyor belts. So they're constantly falling out and being replaced by new ones. They have very powerful bites. They can break bones. They can literally snap bones in half. They are primarily saltwater predators, but there are a select few species that can survive in fresh water, and I find that especially terrifying. Bull, bull sharks, river sharks, Zambezi sharks, they can live in fresh water. Now, you're probably thinking, yeah, but they just get a little ways up a river that empties into the ocean, right? Um, sharks have been found in the Mississippi River as far north as Illinois. Sharks have been found in the Zambezi River in Africa, more than 700 miles inland from the ocean. Uh, it's not real common, but they can get pretty far upstream if they want to. And uh, if this didn't make it bad enough, bull sharks are much more bad-tempered than typical sharks. Um, they have just much more testosterone in their system. They're much more likely to lash out and bite. Plus, they're living in rivers where the visibility is not as good and it's not like sharks have hands so they bite things to feel what's going on. Sharks can detect even a small amount of blood from long distances and they can detect the electrical signals of a fish in distress. And just fundamentally sharks are possibly the closest thing to a monster that you can encounter in real life and that's why I just love them. They have a long history in movies, let's just talk about a few of them. Obviously, Jaws is the most famous one. More recently, we have The Meg. We have Deep Blue Sea and its sequels. Uh, then we get into the Campy Shark movies. Mega Shark vs. Giant Octopus. And of course, there were follow-up movies to that. Mega Shark vs. Crocosaurus. Mega Shark vs. Mecha Shark. There may have been others. Those are the ones I remember off the top of my head. Sharknado and its many sequels. Two, three... Five and six-headed shark attack. Now you're probably looking at this and wondering, where's four-headed shark attack? Well, interesting point, the movie Five-Headed Shark Attack, at the beginning, the shark only has four heads, but much like the Hydra, when it loses a head, it grows back two more. So at some point in the movie, the four-headed shark becomes five-headed shark and they just titled it Five-Headed Shark Attack. Sharktopus, not much of a movie, but a really fun word to say. Say it with me. Sharktopus. It just kind of feels good on your tongue. Open water. The reef. The shallows. And there are many, many more. Now, I am of the generation that saw Jaws on the big screen in my local movie theater when I was very young. I still remember it to this day, and it was just the greatest thing ever. And I have been fascinated with sharks ever since. Frankly, in Steve's opinion, there is no such thing as a bad shark movie. The only question is whether you're watching a good movie or if you're going to have a good time having fun at the movie's expense. One way or another, you're going to enjoy a shark movie. So that's a little talk about sharks in movies.
All right, let's talk about the first film in our Creature Feature Double Feature. This is called Open Water 3, Cage Dive. There's the poster right there. This is a found footage Creature Feature mockumentary. It was released in the year 2017, directed by Gerald Rossianato. And it stars Joel Hogan, Josh Pothoff, and Megan Peta Hill. Three people you've probably not heard of. That's not a bug. That's a feature when it comes to found footage movies. It doesn't interfere with the suspension of disbelief by introducing actors that you recognize from other films. Let's talk about Open Water 3. So the film summary is, it's an Australian found footage mockumentary. It is unrelated to the other films in the Open Water series, except for the overall theme. So, dirty little secret, I have not seen the original Open Water or Open Water 2. This is the only movie in the series that I've watched. You don't need to know anything about the other movies to enjoy this movie. They have nothing to do with each other. It's not like the Jaws series where it's the same characters in all the movie. Uh, basically, all they mean by the title Open Water is, hey, this is going to be a shark movie. The movie revolves around three people on a shark diving tour. You know, the kind of tours where you go out and you get in the cage and get to watch great white sharks. Um, and they're left stranded in the ocean after a rogue wave capsizes the boat. Uh, this one has pretty good shark special effects. Now, I don't know if the sharks were CGI or if this is just real footage of sharks that has been digitally inserted into the movie. My assumption is that uh, a lot of it is real footage that's been digitally inserted into the movie. But regardless, it is pretty convincing. It is pretty realistic. And uh, there, there are, you know, at the beginning of the movie, you also get to see some humpback whales and stuff. There is some really beautiful photography in this movie. Uh, it does not have tons and tons of action, but it does have some good tension and jump scares. Um, the movie is worth watching. It's maybe not the greatest shark movie ever made, but definitely worth watching, especially if you've got some friends coming over and you want to do like uh, a shark double feature. You could definitely make this one of the movies and have a pretty good time. I will say that the movie features one supremely unlikable character. There is a reason the term Jar Jar Binksian is in this week's vocabulary lesson, and when you watch this movie, you will discover why. So let's get to our villain profile. Our villain, Great White Sharks. You see one there with the night vision, which makes them even more terrifying. They belong to a class known as Big Freaking Sharks. Special powers? <laughs> They're sharks. They are terrifying ambush predators with hundreds of teeth and a bite that can literally snap a horse's femur in half. And as far as a signature weapon, did I not mention the hundreds of teeth and a bite that can literally snap a horse's femur in half? It's pretty self-explanatory. Their signature technique is quick ambush strikes, followed by munching and chomping. Now, in real life, great white sharks tend to bite their prey and then kind of just circle and wait for it to bleed to death, but uh, that doesn't make for a great movie, so that's not what happens in the movies. But Anyway, that's your villain profile for uh, our first movie, Open Water 3 Cage Dive. Let's go to the scorecard for the first movie in our double feature, Open Water 3 Cage Dive. Kills. Seven. Now, it's kind of hard to get a count on this because there are more than the three main characters in the movie who are on the boat that capsizes, and we don't know exactly how many die when the boat capsizes. So... I was able to count seven kills associated with the movie. You may come up with a different total on your own. Bare Breasts. Uh, zero. This film is such a tease. I mean, it even plays the joke where just as the bra is about to come off, oop, the battery died in the camera. Oh, it's just infuriating. Car chases. Well, you don't expect car chases in a shark movie, and you're correct. There are no car chases in this one. Jump scares. I counted at least three. Uh, for me, with movies, once the action gets going in earnest, a lot of times I forget to count the jump scares from then on out, so the number might be more than three, but uh, I do recall at least three good ones in the movie. Albatrossian lead characters? Oh, good God, yes, there is one of those. Jar Jar Binksian lead characters? There is one of those as well, and it is the same person. Now, understand, Albatrossian and Jar Jar Binksian are not mutually exclusive terms. You can be one or the other, or both. Deaths from a broken heart. There is one of those. You'll have to watch the movie to learn more about that. And firework related injuries. Well, it's a movie that happens at sea. Obviously there's not one of those. And you're half right. 
Here's one fatality. How does somebody get burned to death due to a fireworks related incident at sea? Well, you just need to watch the movie to find out. But I will say this, it does go back to the fact that one of the lead characters is both Albatrossian and Jar Jar Binksian. So the final score for Open Water 3, we're going to give this one two paws out of four. It is an acceptable found footage shark movie with some decent scares and at least one thoroughly unlikable character. Now, I will be honest, I didn't especially care for any of the lead characters, but there's two of them that you can kind of tolerate, and there's one that, like the vocabulary lesson said, you want to die in every scene. But, all in all, movie's worth watching. Um, it's not an appointment movie. It's not something that you spend the week looking forward to and then watch it, but you'll enjoy it if you make it part of a double feature, especially if you've got friends coming over and have a few drinks. So, that's Open Water 3. So let's get to the second film in today's double feature. This is 47 Meters Down, Uncaged. There's the poster right there. This is a creature feature. It was released in the year 2019, directed by Johannes Roberts. And the cast includes Sophie Nilis, Corrine Fox, Brienne Chu, and Sistine Stallone. And yes, in case you were wondering, that is Jamie Foxx's daughter and Sylvester Stallone's daughter. Let's talk about this movie. So, 47 meters down uncaged. What can we say about this? Well, I'm going to warn you right up front. It is not a fantastic movie. I never would have done this movie as an episode of the show by itself. But again, it's one of those things that kind of works as part of a double feature. So, let's talk about the film a little bit. It is a conventional creature feature filmed in Mexico. Um, so it's not a found footage movie or anything like that. It is a just straight up conventional movie. Uh, it is unrelated to the previous movie, 47 Meters Down, except that it has sharks. Now, let me back up a little bit. Uh, so the original movie, 47 Meters Down, involved uh, two young women who were doing a shark cage dive. So they were in the shark cage when the winch suspending them from the boat suddenly broke, dropping their cage to the bottom of the ocean, trapping them, yes, 47 meters down. Now, if you know anything at all about scuba diving, you know that 47 meters down is pretty darn deep for a recreational scuba diver, and that's part of the drama of the show. Um, 47 meters down is a pretty good movie, um, but it's not available on streaming, at least not right now. So I wanted to stick to something that you could stream, uh, preferably stream for free. So I went with 47 Meters Down Uncaged. So 47 Meters Down Uncaged, not only is it unrelated to the first movie, except for the fact that it involves sharks, uh, it has nothing to do with the title 47 Meters Down. Um, this movie takes place, frankly, in some fairly shallow water, which is good because the divers are down there for a long time. Um, the gist of the movie is that four attractive teen girls go scuba diving to tour some ruins in an undersea cave, and they become trapped with blind, cave-dwelling great white sharks. I'm going to say that again in case you missed it. Blind, cave-dwelling great white sharks. Yes, that is what the movie proposes as a villain. Um, it's biologically implausible. Um, Another thing, just to keep in mind, and they do touch on this in the movie, but uh, just just for my own conscience, you know, scuba diving is a dangerous pursuit um, any way you go about it, but scuba diving inside a cave is crazy dangerous, especially if you are not trained. So that is not something you should ever consider doing on your own without proper training and uh, with people going with you who really know what they're doing. Cave diving is just crazy dangerous. There are terrible shark special effects in this movie. I mean, there's no way to say it. Uh, when I was a child, being a big fan of sharks, I had some toy sharks. I, I had one in particular that was made of foam rubber that you could play with in the bathtub. Um, he looks a lot like the sharks in this movie, only my foam rubber toy looked a lot more realistic than the sharks in this movie. That aside, though, this is a beautiful film, especially in 4K U, uh, Ultra HD, apart from the terrible CGI sharks. There are some other parts of this movie that just look stunning uh, if you have a 4K TV and can stream in 4K. I'm not going to lie. It's kind of a dopey movie, but it is a reasonably fun movie to not take seriously. So getting back to what I talked about earlier, 
There are no bad shark movies. There are only shark movies that you can enjoy and shark movies that you enjoy mocking. This is one of those that probably goes into that second category that you'll enjoy mocking. But if you have some friends over, have some drinks and do a double feature of Open Water 3 and 47 meters down, you'll probably have a pretty good time. Let's get to our villain profile. Blind cave dwelling great white sharks. And I cannot believe I've said that, but that is that is the gist of the movie. You see one right there. Um, these belong to a class of biologically improbable big freaking sharks. Their special powers are enhanced hearing, plus hundreds of teeth and a bite that can literally snap a horse's femur in half. A signature weapon, yet again, we're back to the hundreds of teeth and a bite that can literally snap a horse's femur in half. Signature technique, uh, and once again, we're back to quick ambush strikes followed by munching and chomping. Now, the thing about this movie is you're down in caves, and for a lot of times, the sharks are just kind of ambling around aimlessly and very, very slowly. But you do get some quick ambush strikes when the mood strikes them, so um, the signature technique still applies here as well. Anyway, that's your villain profile for uh, 47 meters down uncaged. Let's go to the scorecard for the second half of our creature feature double feature, 47 meters down, uncaged. Kills, five. Bare breasts, zero. Now, on the one hand, this is a PG-13-ish kind of movie, so I shouldn't be surprised. On the other hand, I am at my wit's end. We are now five episodes into Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat, and there has been an alarming shortage of bare breasts. I am screening various summer camp and teenage uh, cheerleader movies to try to get us out of this rut so hopefully uh, we'll be able to revert back to the mean sometime next week car chases well it's a shark movie so you don't expect any there's none albatrossian lead characters there is one of those jar jar binksian lead characters none so in this one you do have somebody who's albatrossian but she's not so annoying that you want her to die in every scene Implausibly damage-resistant teenage girls. He's gonna say there's one of those. You're wrong. There's two of those. Realistic CGI special effects of blind, cave-dwelling, great white sharks. None. Yeah, you'd think if you're gonna do a movie about blind, cave-dwelling, great white sharks, uh, one of the top three things you'd be worried about is, can I do realistic special effects of a blind cave dwelling great white shark? But apparently that did not occur to the producers of this movie. Um, so there are no realistic shark special effects in this movie. But that's not all. With your viewing of 47 meters down uncaged, you get some bonus features, such as an unbearable pop soundtrack. Oh, I wanted to gouge out my ears. Out of the frying pan into the feeding frenzy. That'll make sense when you watch the movie. Great white sharks hate Roxette. I was not aware of this, but apparently they hate Roxette. If you watch the movie, you'll find out. Aquatic teleportation. Or maybe it's just poor continuity, because there is one scene in this movie where people are banging against the side of the boat, begging to be rescued, and as soon as we go above deck, they are then 30 feet away from the ship. So, aquatic teleportation. You get Sistine Stallone's legs, and they are fantastic. You get Sistine Stallone's hindquarters, and they are really fantastic. And you get long, slow, lovingly drawn out shots of a CGI shark that looks less realistic than a foam rubber pool toy. I don't know why. It's like they wanted to rub your face in the fact that they could not realistically animate a shark. Um, but there you go. So those are some of the bonus features for 47 meters down uncaged. 
So the final score for this movie, well, you, you gotta grade this on the curve. We're giving this two paws out of four. Now, it's a, definitely a one paw movie if you go into it taking it seriously, or maybe even a half paw movie. But if you're looking for something that's kind of fun to have fun with and you're not trying to take seriously, it's a two paw movie. You can have fun with this one. So that's 47 meters down uncaged. Well, we're almost to the end, but before we go, let's talk about some other stuff Steve watched this week. Number one, the Poughkeepsie Tapes. This is basically a movie featuring disturbing home movies shot by a prolific and disturbed serial killer. This one is incredibly dark and disturbing. It's basically torture porn. Uh, this is an excellent movie if you can handle an incredibly dark and disturbing movie. Uh, this is not the kind of movie that features jump scares and things that make you think something's sneaking up behind you. Uh, basically, this is just like being dragged through a ditch for an hour and a half of just increasingly more and more shocking and disturbing things as you delve more and more into the videotapes that this serial killer has left behind. But if you know that going in and it's the kind of thing you can handle, it is an excellent movie. Number two, Werewolf, The Beast Among Us. There's a werewolf terrorizing a village. Can the hunters find it in time? Now, I don't know if this was a Sci-Fi Channel original movie, but it certainly looks and feels like a Sci-Fi Channel original movie, and I do not mean that as a compliment. Um, no. I'm going to be very, very upfront with you here. The only reason I watched this movie is that I was hoping to do a future episode of the show where we do maybe a uh, creature feature, double feature with uh, werewolf movies, and I was looking for some werewolf movies. Um, this was one of the movies I tried. I am very surprised to myself that I stuck with this one to the end because I knew from right up front that it just wasn't good. Uh, it did not get better. So, you know, give me points for hanging in there, but uh, I assume that I watched this so you don't have to and stay away from this one. Final movie, The Void. Another one Steve really likes. This combines supernatural and sci-fi monster action with a really interesting story. There are lots of gory, violent special effects. There are lots of practical special effects in there, in this. Some practical special effect monsters and some really weird monster special effects. So if you are a fan of John Carpenter's The Thing, uh, you could, you're, you're probably going to like this one. Uh, it is excellent. I recommend this one highly. Uh, we may work this one into a future episode of the show to talk about it in more detail, but uh, just for... Um, for the purposes of this episode, I highly recommend The Void. So that's some other stuff Steve watched this week. Well, that wraps it up for yet another episode of Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. I am your host, Steve the Cat. Oh, gotcha. Not actually Steve the Cat. This is the voice of Carl, the production assistant. This is Fancy the Animatronic, st standing in for Steve's animatronic stunt double, who normally stands in for Steve. Hope you've enjoyed the show. Be good to each other. Please remember to tip your servers, and we'll see you back real soon. Bye-bye. Well, Steve, I see you're making friends with our new host. Um, I did look in the box. It turns out there are some instructions. It says to activate the animatronic effects, we need to squeeze the paw. So let's lean in here and give that a squeeze. Um, and now the lights are out. Give me the power, I beg of you! <laughs>